Hello, my name is David Hopewell. I'm a former uh, senior archaeologist at Gwynedd Archaeological Trust. I've now retired. Uh, this has given me a bit of chance, a bit of a chance to look at some. I think we call them legacy projects, things that haven't been quite finished off. And today I'm looking at uh, Tre Carey Hillfort. This was actually the first project that I ran at Gwynedd Archaeological Trust. This was the Tre Carey Conservation Project that ran from 1989 to 1999. It was funded and administered by Dweevor District Council and Gwynedd Council and CADU. And the, and the archaeological recording and on-site supervision was carried out by Gwynedd Archaeological Trust, initially by Eve Boyle for the first three years and by myself for the remaining seven. And the building work was carried out by a team of three local stonemasons from TIR Construction. Trinacary is an Iron Age hill fort on the north coast of the Llyn Peninsula in northwest Wales. It stands on the at 485 metres on the easternmost of the three peaks of Er Eiffel. A quick run through, it's an Iron Age hill fort, Romano-British occupation, two stone ramparts standing close to their original height of two to three metres. The inner rampart encloses 1.8 hectares. There are about 160 huts, five entrances, and a Bronze Age cairn on the summit. There are also extra mural enclosures. Uh, importantly, the mountain is covered in a block field of micro granite slabs, which make ideal uh, and very durable uh, building material. And also because there's so much of it, nobody is bothered to walk up here and steal stones from the walls, which uh, is a very important part of its uh, rather unusually good preservation. It's been there's been quite a lot of work done here over the years. The first record I can find was in Pennant's Tours of Wales, which has the first rather inaccurate plan and, a, and, a, and an engraving of it. Described it as the most perfect, magnificent, as well as the most artful of any British post I ever beheld. It is called Tre Kyrie, or the Tra Town of the Fortresses. Uh, it's also sometimes uh, translated as Town of the Giants, which actually may be a slightly more credible translation. There have been quite a lot of excavations Briefly, uh, 1903, Reverend Baring Gould, who also wrote Onward Christian Soldiers, and Robert Bernard excavated 32 huts in 10 days. And then in 1906, Harold Hughes produced the first accurate plan of the fort, excavated 32 huts and examined the southwest entrance all in 12 days. These were all done using teams of workmen uh, and were not really up to modern archaeological standards, shall we say. In 1939, uh, Bursu, Gresham and Hemp did some more excavations under slightly better conditions. And then the most modern excavation was by AHA Hogg for the Royal Commission, who excavated the southwest postern and an, and an additional 10 huts and produced what has up to now been the standard uh, site plan. There are a lot of finds that uh, came from the various... Uh, Excavations, stratified context not recorded in the early excavations and not much in the, not much survived in the form of stratified context in, in the more modern stuff. Um, there were a few Iron Age finds, but most of the, most of the finds came from AD 150 to 400, including, uh, quite a bit of Roman pottery, including um, mortarium. This, uh, very nice gold plated fibula or bow brooch, a beaded talk which I think was probably a bit, probably pre-Roman, a shale ring, melon beads, uh, spindle whirls, and various iron tools. Uh, the reasons for the project, uh, this aerial photograph from before the project pretty much sums it up. We can see very well uh, preserved rampart here, but there are quite a number of serious collapses. And now the the original entrances to the fort had been blocked by rubble due to collapses and people were generally coming, getting into the fort by climbing over collapses in the ramparts. The masonry, when it is intact, is very stable. It is all built from headers without any stretchers, so that's all stones running into the wall. But when you get a collapse, it means the collapses tend to get wider and some of these were getting wider at about a metre a year. And it was quite rightly pointed out that the, the large parts of the rampart would disappear very quickly if nothing was done about it. Uh, this gives an idea of the extent of the collapses, quite a few. 
not all as serious as, as the ones we could see on the photograph. Um, it was decided after much deliberation that the best way to actually stabilise these collapses is a perfect example of people clambering over with great regularity um, was to rebuild or reinstate the facing and the wall across the collapse thus uh, supporting the masonry on either side. This all required very detailed recording, anything that was original that was likely to move or need resetting was numbered and taken away and put in back put back in exactly the right place uh, we found that most of the collapses were caused by movements in the in the stone and the scree underneath the wall uh, didn't seem to be anything deliberate in there and a rebuilt collapse uh, this was this was taken pretty much straight after uh, things have weathered in quite a lot better uh, actually stabilizes the the original surviving masonry and all of the uh, re replacement masonry was marked with these uh, small drill holes that you can see here. There are quite a lot of limitations to the project. Disturbance must be kept to an, an absolute minimum. No in situ masonry could be disturbed unless on the point of collapse. Uh, no in situ archaeological horizons to be disturbed and research was explicitly not the aim of the project. Um, the outcomes of the project were we now have a stable uh, site with accessible ent entrances. Uh, having visited 23 years later, there's been practically hardly any stones moved at all. Uh, the site is better presented, uh, perhaps inspiring a bit more respect for the archaeology. And we have a very good record of the site and of understand a better understanding of the masonry phasing. And there were a couple of finds that are of uh, in some importance. We have produced a nice new uh, plan of the site, with it, which has a, quite a bit more information on it. I think the best thing is if I just go through uh, the various features of the fort and describe what, what we discovered uh, along with a general description. So if you look at the ramparts first, uh, they are quite impressive dry stone ramparts standing up to three and a half metres uh, tall. Uh, they, the inner rampart uh, rivets the break of slope around the mount around the top of uh, a kind of a plateau on top of the mountain which uh, contains the the hill fort and then there's a second uh, probably later uh, rampart that you can see on this photograph so yes as we can see the ramparts are very well preserved this is mostly original original masonry i think the the project probably replaced about i think we reckoned about six percent of the masonry on the rampart so not not a huge intervention we know that the ramparts are standing pretty much close to their original height for much of their circuit because we've have still got this uh, parapet wall walk surviving in quite a few places uh, there are five entrances through the rampart so we'll have a quick look at those now the northwest entrance was the main entrance into the fort. Uh, it passes through the uh, the outer rampart here, through quite a monumental entrance with these huge stones uh, uh, on the entrance way. Uh, this doesn't sort of continue along the rest of this rampart, which actually just fizzles out at the ends and doesn't connect up to anything. Is not really a very good defensive. Uh, feature maybe more for show this one or maybe they just never finished it the entrance through the inner rampart goes through this very long sunken uh, passage with high walls on either side so this is a plan of it and we can see the outer rampart there the, the outer rampart quite explicitly blocks off the the original track coming up to the to the uh, northwest entrance so it looks like that was a secondary construction uh, there was a major collapse which had part pretty much blocked up the the entrance passage uh, which we decided needed uh, conserving uh, this was cleared and we found that the collapse was caused by uh, 
I think some stones had just tipped forward in the base at the base of the wall, but it wasn't really bonded in very well to the rest of the wall because there was another face behind it showing we were looking at uh, two phases of entrances here. And within the, the core of the collapsed masonry, there were 25 sherds of a mid second to third century Seven Valley ware jar, giving us uh, some dating evidence for, for the remodeling of the entrance. So this is a plan of the entrance. Uh, we can see we've got, I think about two and a half wide, meter wide uh, passage running through to a, a constriction just as you come through the ramparts. And it looks like the original entrance was probably just a simple uh, gap in the ramparts and then various walls have been added on to produce these sort of flanking walls of the, of the passageway, for the passageway. Uh, the other main entrance, though possibly not quite as spectacular, was at the southwest. This is a, a, a meandering track that uh, passes through the, a lot of uh, extramural enclosures, possibly cattle pens or denuded fields, a bit difficult to know exactly what they are, uh, and then uh, passes through uh, another modified entrance. You can see here this one wasn't quite isn't quite as spectacular and is and is uh, somewhat narrower um, again it looks as though the original uh, entrance may have just been a fairly simple gap through the rampart but we've got added bastions and uh, and flanking walls here um, difficult to know how much of it was at, was uh, for remodeling and how much of it was uh, stabilization there seems to have been a fair amount of problems with uh, the scree uh, the steep scree here uh, moving underneath the wall this is what it looks like not quite as spectacular spectacular as the other one uh, but with these big uh, bastions built uh, thickening the rampart to either side of the entrance passage there were three poston gates um, Two of them have been blocked for a long time, not entirely clear whether they were deliberately blocked or not. Uh, the northern postern retained a lintel over the, which carried the wall over the postern gate. It was pretty much on the point of collapse. There were a couple of lintels still in place, but as you can see on the left hand side of this, it was just on the point of collapse. So this was, uh, dismantled stone by stone every, with everything marked up and rebuilt using the original two lintels and a couple of additional stones that were taken from the scree. And it now looks like this. So if you look at the interior, we spent five years also looking at the huts. Uh, these are in various groups uh, within the fort. Uh, they were not in too bad condition when we came to look at them, but uh, there were major problems caused by uh, treasure hunters un, uh, digging below the uh, level of the base of the wall, which caused collapses. And also, it must be said, uh, archaeological excavations from the various periods of archaeology uh, had, had undermined the walls in several places. So there's quite a bit of stabilisation needed to uh, arrest the erosion here. Looking at the huts in detail, uh, there are 160 structures which are often described as uh, roundhouses and rectangular huts. And in actual fact, there are 11 undivided roundhouses and 11 rectangular huts, plus 93 irregular huts or small cells and 30 huts divided, uh, derived from subdivided roundhouses and a few animal pens. Uh, and it looks like there were probably around 26 uh, Iron Age roundhouses, and most of the rest of it is a uh, is a later phase of building. Zooming into uh, an area of huts here, we can see that we have subdivided roundhouses and small cells built around them. Looking at it in a bit more detail, we have phase one huts here, and then with added subdivisions and then to produce two D-shaped huts with the ends kind of cut off to produce sub-rectangular pairs of huts. 
and then the other buildings were added around these possibly in patches of scree where there were where there was uh, a lot of stone available the buried walls of the iron age roundhouses often showed signs of collapse uh, behind the added masonry suggesting that they were, had been abandoned or in, and were in quite bad condition before they were subdivided uh, i think this indicates uh, a, there was a reoccupation of the site and not a, un, an unbroken period of, of occupation all the way through the iron age and the Ro romano british period what conclusions can we draw it appears that the f iron age uh, phase of the hill fort consisted of a, a probable single single rampart with entrances and simple gaps in the rampart and at least 26 roundhouses. I think there was probably a period of ab abandonment immediately after the Roman conquest. Then we've got reoccupation in the mid second century, elaboration of entrances and probably the addition of the monumental outer rampart. Subdivision of most of the large roundhouses and additional and building of additional cellular buildings and also construction of uh, 11 rectangular buildings. Uh, finds show that much of this occurred in the mid 2nd to 4th century. Interestingly, not much found in the rectangular buildings. Could they be uh, early med? Uh, not, not really enough evidence to be sure. The changes in the huts imply that there was a change of function, at least to some extent, between the Iron Age and the Romano-British uh, occupation. Debate tends to get polarised, with some seeing hill forts as purely symbolic structures with no defensive role, in contrast to other uh, to earlier interpretations seeing them as purely defensive structures. I think the evidence at Trey Carey suggests multiple and evolving functions. In the Iron Age, we have a semi-permanently occupied settlement. Finds of a small saddle quern and spindle whorls indicate more than short-term occupation. However, year-round occupation at a height of 485 metres seems unlikely, as does independent survival of a village in, in the resource poor uplands. This suggests it's a focus for a wider community uh, or a tribal grouping living in lowland farms. Uh, the roundhouses produce social spaces and hint at, and the whole thing hints perhaps at an origin link to uh, summer upland grazing. Um, having said all this, it could still work as a refuge. The large climbable perimeter and multiple entrances suggest keeping livestock inside would be at least as important as keeping raiders out. I suspect that the hill fort was not actually used during the Roman military phase at the beginning of the occupation, but uh, was reoccupied when the Roman presence changed from a militarised invading force to a more administrative occupation. All but one of the Roman forts in the area were abandoned and there was a very small garrison. This might, it might be suggested that previously suppressed tribal leaderships and groupings again became more important. The addition of the outer rampart could be seen as a statement of power with its monumental gate to the main entrance built from massive stones within a rather permeable, shall we say, outer rampart. It, it just stops, you can just walk around the end of it. It's not a great defensive feature. Wider political instability probably led to more raiding from Ireland and elsewhere, and the power vacuum left by the Romans could have led to like local rivalries becoming uh, significant again. The blocking of the two posterns, possible, and, addition, and additions to the main entrances could indicate a structure with both symbolic power and practical defensive features. In the interior, the Romano-British occupation involved a change from around 26 round, roundhouses in the Iron Age to 123 small cellular, build, cellular buildings with 11 retained roundhouses and, and 11 rectangular buildings. The often impractically small cells that resulted do not really suggest the same stable, semi-permanent settlement that we see in the Iron Age. There are certainly fewer large social spaces, for instance. At this time, it looks like the primary function was fitting a lot of people or possibly even goods if some structures were for storage into Trecary. Uh The smaller structures would have been much easier to roof in comparison to uh, large roundhouses. And it kind of suggests uh, a more urgent or short-term occupation than in the Iron Age. 
It might be suggested that the closely clustered cellular buildings were designed as reusable refuges, suitable for relatively short-term occupation in times of danger, or alternatively, reusable buildings for use in social gatherings for the population of the surrounding territory, or indeed, both functions. We can't really distinguish between these functions from our limited archaeological evidence. So, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to leave, leap to any firm conclusions with no decent evidence. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.